Hey everyone and welcome back to The Knowledge. Now this week we're taking a slightly different tact. Over the last few weeks we've been really focusing and dialing into that recovery. Now we're going to talk about the tools that we use in our sport. Today we're going to really focus on running and the most important tool, in my book anyway, is running shoes. Now it just so happens that the man beside me right now, Finlay McAndrew, has had over 10 years of experience within the running industry and he has probably fitted over what 10,000 pairs of shoes to different runners friendly so we've got in-house we've got so much knowledge when it comes to running technology and of course we're going to dispel some of the myths and how you can actually pick the proper running shoe for you because there's so much information out there a lot of it is fad and a lot of it is industry driven but you having had that amount of years of experience I would say you're probably the main man to actually dig into this so Let's start digging, buddy. Let's start getting so many key things. And first of all, let's talk about what does a running shoe actually do for you? Yeah, so that's a really in interesting question. What, what can a running shoe do for you? Uh, and there's no, not necessarily one answer to that because what sometimes isn't recognized or isn't communicated well by running brands is that diff running shoes are actually designed for different purposes. Um, and to explain how they're designed for different purposes, it's really important to understand actually what's happening when you're running. So what the best thing way to explain it to somebody is if you were to jump as high as you could, you, would, you wouldn't jump with straight legs, you would squat down and then you would jump back up again. So when you squat down, all your muscles, tendons and ligaments store elastic energy and then when we jump back up, that's returned. And that, that's a really simple um, explanation of that and that's called our stretch shortening cycle. And that's every time we run, that's what's happening. Our, it's effectively a single leg hop. And it's quite an explosive and quite a damaging and destructive action, which is why sometimes people can get sore after they've run. And slight side note, but that's, if you look at the difference between cycling and running, for example, that's why cyclists can sometimes find running harder work is because cycling is a very concentric action where you're always applying the force whereas running's hopping and vice versa runners can find it quite hard to be good cyclists you look at the difference in leg structure of a runner versus a, a cyclist but so this running action is is a like i said it's, it's very destructive on the muscles so one of the main things a running shoe can do is reduce the load that's going through our leg when we're running and making it easier so the vast majority of running or training that people should be doing is we know of what we've talked about in the past is is more aerobic training more steadier pace easier pace training so what we're trying to get a shoe to do with those sessions is to make it as easy and as unstressful as possible and that's a really interesting to thing to talk about running it sometimes veers away where people think you know you want to work hard and you want to make things difficult for you but in every other sport, I know, you know, we try and make things as easy as possible for ourselves. So why, why not do that with running? Um, so what I wanted to get across to people was how cushioning actually works. So more cushioning doesn't actually absorb that much more force of landing. It's the effect it has on your leg. So another way to explain that analogy is if you were to jump off a wall and jump onto sand or jump onto mud or grass, you would uh, bend your legs less to absorb the impact than you would if you jumped onto concrete. So our muscles and tendons and flex will, will bend every time we land on hard ground to absorb the force. Now, how cushioning in a shoe works is the higher the shoe is off the ground, so that's called the stack height of the shoe, the thickness of the sole, and how soft the material is will then affect how much our leg flexes because it can actually do more work for us. So if we're running longer or slower and we want to make that running easier, cushioning is one of the first things that can do that. It actually can stop that bend from happening as much. And this is, again, something we want to get across is cushioning is demonized by some people and it should never be demonized in any, any sense. There's, there's nothing wrong with cushioning when it's used in the right sense, in the right place. Now, the opposite of how what a running shoe can do apart from protection is it can enhance energy return and then help make faster running easier. So what makes a good shoe good for a, a cushion shoe good for longer or slower running can actually then work against you for faster runs. 
because you're going to lose some energy that's going through the shoe and you're going to also lose some of that elastic return from the stretch shortening cycle. Mm -hmm. So if we want to run faster, we want a shoe that's going to enhance that energy return either from the midsole or in how it makes our legs flex. So this is where we have different shoes for different sessions. So I think if people can start looking at their footwear in a case of, well, actually, for my long runs or my easy runs, I'm going to wear that footwear type. And then for my faster runs or for sessions when I'm pushing the pace or even in races, I'm going to look at wearing a slightly different shoe. So this kind of goes into this, this spell that there's, there's never a best shoe. There's also never a best brand. It's about what's right for the right situation and, you know, and for and for what type of session so that in a nutshell is kind of the, the two main things that a running shoe is doing it can either act as a protection mechanism to ease the load on your muscles or it can act as a tool to help you to run faster that that that's that's the that's in essence really what a running shoe does that's that's something that i obviously i'm not a runner but I still do quite a lot of running. I run off road quite a lot, and I, and I substitute a lot of my if I am starved for time, especially even on, on on rest weeks. I'll do a bit more running just to change things up. And I think it's really important for a cyclist who has been predominantly non weight bearing all of his sport and life, along with your rest week, that running is really important for a bone density and ultimately it helps keep you fit. And for bang for buck, you can literally just go, "I'm going to go for a run for an hour," and you. Yeah. Go oh, instead of going right. So I'm going to go for two hours. Uh, what way is the wind blowing? What kit do I need to wear? How warm is it outside? How many water bottles do I need? Oh, I'm punctured. So it's all these things. And for me, it, it was a very, very simple and, and a quite a refreshing way of changing my training up. But I never ever thought, Finley, to be honest with you, that you would have different shoes. And it makes absolute sense to have different shoes for different kinds of running. When you ride your bike you have different hand positions. So when you're riding steady or easy, you generally ride on the tops or on the hoots. Your body position is pretty upright, but also if you're going to be doing a more dynamic session, you may be out the saddle more, or you may be a bit more aerodynamic, working on that postural discipline, trying to make sure when you are in that position in a, in a competitive aspect, you can hold that. But this is something I never ever thought about for running. And that, that again, for me, is um, that's a big eye-opener, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't realised that, because I've always just kind of, and I suppose this kind of leads on to what you're talking about the stretch shorten uh, mechanism is that I had, I'd read many books and one of the books that I read is a book by Kelly Starrett, so The Supple Leopard, and it was Born to Run, I think it was called. And he ultimately says that every human being should be able to run. Yeah. But it goes into talking about stack height of drop, etc. Can what Ultimately, what is drop and why would that change? And... I suppose it's a bit of a silly question, but is there, is there like an ideal drop in a running shoe or is it such an individual thing like bike fitting? Yeah, it's, it, it, that's really, you know, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's really a very individual thing when it comes to footwear. So drop in a running shoe is the, the, difference, in the, um, the difference in height from the heel to the forefoot. And this is something that's really evolved over years in footwear as well, is traditionally like a higher drop shoe would, imply that it had more cushioning and a lower drop shoe would suggest it had less cushioning um, in it but that's not the case where there's very different geometries used in shoes now and, and um, very different mechanisms used to help the help the leg help the feet um, and you get you could have two shoes with the same amount of drop a low drop which would be some somewhere around four millimeters a higher drop shoe would be in the region of eight to twelve millimeters but you could get two shoes with a low drop where they're completely different as an example that shoe there has quite a low drop and yeah. um, but this is a racing shoe and is very firm very hard and will make your legs work quite hard this shoe from Hawker also has quite a low drop but look at the difference in the thickness of the shoe yeah a much higher much a much bigger thickness um, in the in the sole and what that does is really re reduces leg flexion and reduces stress. And th this was, I mean, this was one of the most interesting parts I, I probably found in, um, in working in the running industry uh, was, was there was a huge movement at one point towards uh, barefoot running. Um, and it was from a lot of people that read Born to Run. And this gave this notion that we should all run on our forefoot 
and that it's wrong to land on your heel. Uh, there will still be some people who disagree with me, but I can guarantee you that's categorically wrong to say that, that you should land on your, your forefoot when you run, because it's a wrong argument. The important part is how you land underneath your hips and in relation to your center of gravity. So the idea of when somebody talks about heel, heel striking is that you get an equal and opposite force back from the ground. So you get a braking uh, action, which slows you down. But what they don't tell you, and, and some, this is where data gets utilized so poorly and taken totally out of context. So if you see a force curve for somebody landing on their heel, you'll see a line that goes up, a force line that goes up, and then it'll drop a bit, and then you'll see another curve. And if you see a force curve for something like somebody landing on their forefoot, you'll see one curve. And the proponents of forefoot running will tell you that that little spike that happens at the start of the heel strike is, is gone in a forefoot land, but it's not, it's just delayed and it just shifts into one curve. Really? And the, the loading is equal. And what's really important to note is if you land on your heel, you'll load your knee. Now, if you land on your forefoot, you'll load your ankle. And your ankle is a much uh, weaker um, joint than your knee. Knee pain is the number one injury in running though, which is why people try and change away to uh, sometimes to forefoot running. And sometimes what, what, would, what was happening with the, with the sort of this huge movement towards forefoot running and barefoot running was that um, runners would get knee pain and they would start adjusting how they were running and running in a lower drop shoe, so a thinner shoe. But all they were doing was taking the load from their knee and applying it somewhere else. So the knee pain might go, but what you weren't hearing about was all the runners that were six or seven months down the line tearing, snapping their Achilles tendon wow. or causing pl serious plantar pain. Or in some cases, people were actually moving the, the tissue on the bottom of their foot and exposing their metatarsal heads and damaging your fat pad. And the issue with uh, that is once you damage your fat pad, it never regenerates. It's like little springs and you can't ever heal that. Um, and I, I mean, I, uh, not to say too many horror stories, but I heard um, there was one girl who she ran in a barefoot shoe and she snapped her plantar, fasc her plantar ligament, which is the strongest ligament in your body. Oh. And it took about a year to heal. So th this, is, this is what kind of some of the stuff I wanted to cover is there's, there is so much out there from people giving advice, which is totally opinionated, totally anecdotal and just isn't right. And the running industry has a bit of a role to play in that for a long time support was sold in the wrong way to people so people were missold um too much support in running shoes for too long which caused them problems and kind of what i want to get across as a general theme throughout this like discussion is that extremes never work for people it's it's about applying what's right in the right situation for you and not listening to other people but making an informed decision so I, I'm not, most people will know what pronation is, for example. Um, a simple way to explain this is it gets talked about in lots of different ways. But if you have your hands and you roll it over, it's pronation. You roll it the other way, it's supination. And the way to remember it's holdable will sup and go supination. It doesn't just apply to your feet, it applies to your hands as well. So when we land, our feet land on the outside and then they roll in the way. And that movement of rolling is pronation. And this, again, gets demonized and it's said it's a bad thing where, where people are told you're a pronator or you pronate. That's everyone, but everyone pronates, everyone rolls in. Um, so what we want with a shoe to do, uh, again, going back to how a shoe can work, is, is work with our bodies and work with us. And people were, for years in the running industry, were sold shoes that had almost too much support with them that ended up pushing their feet out and that caused them problems as well so they went from a really supportive shoe that was causing them problems to running in a really minimal shoe and um, something that was classed as a barefoot shoe and it would initially feel better because they could move but that would then cause longer term problems and again it's just it's trying to always put a plaster on something and not actually really understand what you're doing and what's going on and that that really kind of takes you into how to how to pick footwear and and actually go, so talking about drop and stack height and actually what yeah what do you need uh, to, to to run well and and what's right for each person. That's 
that that rings a bell with me because I've got notoriously ultra flat feet and I was always told, oh, you pronate really badly. And I remember the first pair of shoes I got were a pair of Asics 2310s and they had a massive bit on the inside of the foot. And they were okay, but they were so bulky and chunky. And I felt like I couldn't even make, I didn't actually feel like I had much feedback from the ground. If that depends. And I ran with them for a while and then, Nah, I, I kind of went away from them. But then I went to a shoe which was like a like a Nike free kind of shoe where there's a lot more kind of movement and my foot could do what I wanted to. And I found that was actually a lot better for me as a, yeah. as a, in my transition to running. And I ended up yeah. with those shoes until they pretty much fell apart, which is another thing we're going to obviously come across is yeah. wear of shoe and what the indicators are. But I suppose that's all part of getting your shoes when you first buy your shoes, that's all part of the the conversation with the shoe fitter, isn't it? About how many miles you have that shoe and when it should be changed and what the telltale signs and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, that's, I mean, that, that is your classic example, what's happened to you there. So how, how to pick a shoe is really difficult. It's based on so many factors. So the, the historical thing that would be done is my arch is this shape, what shoe should I wear? And I know straight away from listening to you being told that you were fitted with a 2310, that that was the wrong shoe for your feet. Mm. Because one of the first things you need to do is get a shoe to complement the shape of your foot. Now, if you've got a slightly flatter arch on the inside, typically it'll be a bit broader there. Now, Asics as a shoe, I've got an Asics shoe here, they add additional support in this section of the shoe, right in the middle, and they narrow the shoe there. And they're a Japanese brand, And they're designed for people with uh, slightly thinner, higher arches that have some instability when they're running. So that would be totally the wrong shoe for you. You'd be you'd be really aware of the shoe. It would press into you, and you'd feel almost unstable in it, even though it was meant to be supportive. So, yeah. Now, so I, but obviously, I've I've seen. I'd like to think most things in people's feet, but I still see new stuff all the time in footwear, but I've seen so many different examples. And almost every time I fit somebody for shoes, they're, they're coming to us with a problem. They're either saying their shoes are uncomfortable and they're getting pain, or they, or they just aren't sure what's right and, and they want some help. And where I really trust what, what the foot, like fitting process and getting footwear right is serve so many people who have come with problems or issues and then they come back and speak to us or or they they let us know how well they've got on with their shoes but how this sort of you know we're talking around about how to how to pick shoes is yeah it's really a two-way process what what's right for you so if we're looking at running shoes there's two main categories you have neutral shoes and then you have stability shoes now why I call it a neutral shoe and a stability shoe and not a neutral shoe and a support shoe is if you call it that, you would imply that every shoe has support in it, that a neutral shoe doesn't have support in it when it does. So I always find it quite interesting whenever I'm listening to a cycling podcast, sometimes cyclists say, oh, I maybe don't have, didn't have time to go out for a, for a ride. So I've gone out for a 20 minute run, but my legs are agony afterwards and they're knackered afterwards. And maybe that's the case because they're doing something different. Yeah. But there's always a case, my first thought is, what shoes are they running in? And again, this goes back to the issue of running in shoes, which are, um, which if, if something actively makes your feet work harder, you're going to expect to be sore after it. Yeah. That, that's how to look at footwear. So first thing, really explain with a, with a shoe is, if you look at the outer edge of the shoe there, you see we've got this gel on here. Now that part is effectively called a crash pad. Um, now when we land, Feet land, everyone lands on the outside of the shoe. That's why your shoe wear is down there. And then our feet roll in the pronate. And as we said, that's to shock absorb. Now, the reason our feet pronate is, is because of the torque going, is, that's going through their leg. So that's really important that this outer edge of the shoe slows that pronation down. So when we're trying to pick a shoe, we're looking at what speed somebody's running at. So if somebody's running slower and at steadier paces, then their foot's going to be on the ground for longer than if they're running faster. So if you're running at slower speeds, we want more of a crash pad to slow that speed of that pronation down. If you're running at faster speeds, that could then work against you. So that's a, that's a simple thing. So first thing we look at is the shape of your feet. 
the shape of your feet will then affect the comfort of the shoe because if something's too narrow it's going to press on you and that's going to cause a problem if it's too wide your foot's going to move around in it next thing to look at is how much your feet roll in so if your feet are not rolling in that much they just pronate in a bit and the achilles and the ankle are quite straight then we are typically looking at more of that neutral category of shoe but neutral is a very broad category if it then you'll see differences if somebody's feet then start to roll in further what we're always trying to avoid in running is rotation through the leg because that's what in theory causes problems and that's where a stability shoe on the inside or, or sometimes now the whole way around will have some form of structure which is designed to reduce how much your foot's rolling in but this is what's really involved evolved over the years is it's very easy to stop pronation you just put a denser block of um uh, foam in the shoe and that will stop your foot rolling in but the knee and the rest of the leg can still rotate in and it's actually not solving the problem which is probably what happens with yourself where there is what running shoes have, have, have how they've really evolved is they're now using what they call much more holistic styles of support much more natural styles of support so the actual shoe works with the whole leg and this is where it's finding a, a, a support that works for that person and you can take two shoes which are identical in levels of stability but they'll work in very different ways for different people so different brands will put that stability and that support in different places and everyone you can have two people with equal levels of movement but their feet will move in different ways so you could you could get two runners two um, runners who are getting almost identical knee pain on the outside of the knee and one runner's maybe got a pair of shoes and that's that fitted for their shoes and that solved their problem and then somebody else has then gone well I'll, I'll get that shoe because that caused that solved their problem but actually the root of the cause is coming from a totally different place and that shoe doesn't solve their problem and causes them more problems yeah. so there's Pick, picking shoes is is difficult there's not an easy way to do it and you know not to, i obviously fit people for running shoes and there may be may it sound like there's an element of bias there to that process but from my experience it is absolutely impossible to pick footwear without actually going through a process of trying them properly and being assessed and using but also recognizing it is a two-way process you have to use your feedback as well but I think we we know of there's been cases where there's been pro athletes who've been given shoes and every pro athlete who's on that brand gets the same shoe. And obviously there have been issues with that, hasn't there? Totally. Um, I think that's one of the my biggest criticisms of the running industry is there's the athletes get pro contracts. I mean, I, I heard something a while ago where somebody was saying they wouldn't wear a footwear brand unless they were be, being paid £30,000 or €30,000 a year by by a brand and I just saw in my head that that's absolutely ridiculous because that is such an important tool for you to you to use and so many elite athletes get Achilles injuries get knee problems get you know so many issues because they're running in footwear which just isn't right and because there's a perception that they're an elite I've, I've spoken to brands where they think that the athlete knows best and they actually have no idea they don't know what they're doing and they just, and some athletes, if they don't know, they don't know. If you, if you don't know, if you don't get told something and you have no idea, you just think, you know, running, running's running. And it's of no surprise where like looking at the triathlon world, looking at guys like, you know, the Brownlee brothers, you, if you watch the Brownlee brothers on running on television and you see someone like Alistair Brownlee's ankle moving, there is no surprise he has had an absolute catalog of ankle injuries. It's because he's running a shoe which hasn't given him enough support at the right points and, and worked with him in the right way. And he's cost, caused loads of stress to, to, certain, to certain issues. So you have to be very careful with how you pick your shoes based on what somebody else is using. It's, it's crazy how almost the consumers actually got more power in that situation than the professional athlete because you ultimately, and I suppose... The thing about cycling, from my background, you always get given, everyone get given the same shoes, but the great thing with the shoes was that you could have your own orthotic. You could maybe, now they're doing wider shoes for obviously people who've got wider feet, and a lot of people were riding, 
with shoes which were too narrow for their foot. And the foot is ultimately overlapping the outside, overlapping natural carbon sole, which is incredibly stiff pushing up. And yeah. that to me was like, just now, in the last sort of four or five years, you started seeing, you know, all that data now being accumulated like they are doing with, with running. It's like you're just saying there and now going, well, that doesn't work for that person. So why don't we give them, I don't know, a, a different insole or why don't we give them a, a different width of saddle? Because it's, it's they're the two main structural parts. When it comes to running, the two most important structural parts are the bits that are hitting the ground first. And that's your feet. And it, I can see why you are so critical of the running industry when it comes to that, because that's just, that's that's basics. You should be looking at what the people do and how it's not just, you know, pay them 30 grand and give them unlimited amount of shoes, because that's yeah. not actually going to help the longevity of their career at all, is it? So it's it's a funny one, but this is also then leads on to, I suppose we kind of speak about how some brands don't evolve, but what have been sort of, sort of the main evolutions that you've sort of seen in recent years? I mean, they're obviously the Kipchoge thing, and the new Hoka shoes and all that sort of stuff. What have you actually seen come through which you really thought that actually, there's been a lot of thought put into that and that is actually a massive game changer. You've also got other shoes like, so the, um, is it the On shoes as well, which are like little clouds? I know yeah. they're massive. They, they support the guys at GTN and they're always running in them and all that sort of stuff. And I suppose that might be a shoe you would use for your longer runs. I don't know. But this is, there's so many different kinds of technology out there. There's carbon plates, there's, little cushions like everywhere and I remember when the, the first Nike air bubble came out it's like you don't see air bubbles in running shoes so why yeah. do you see that so what sort of stuff have you seen through the evolution of running shoes that you thought that's good and you think it's here to stay well yeah there's been a, there have been a lot of uh, big advancements in technology over the last few years just through greater understanding better materials better production methods and um, more people running as well it's more data and yeah. um, you know the, the brands go to an incredible amount of research collecting data from runners uh you know i think people would be interested to know that brands will get somebody on a running track and get them to run a marathon and film their gait every time going around the track and, and look at the biomechanics that's how they you know they construct a running shoe um but really one of the biggest things that's evolved over the last few years few years is the evolution of cushioning and how much more it can protect us and if we take this back to again like the the barefoot running that 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 was a fad and some people still do that but they you know i'm not going to mention the brand but you know one of the biggest proponents of barefoot running um got got sued because all of the claims that they hmm. yeah <laughs> because they, that they made were anecdotal Between and there were a lot of, and and the wristbands you used to get that made you feel better as well i think yeah. oh, the company you're talking about yes yeah so that's the kind of thing which, when you get something which is, um, which is based on an opinion, it will never last because it will always get uh, found and, and um, sort of come across, um, you know, caught out. Um, so cushioning is one of the major things, and that's what's really differentiated those the band, uh, the brands apart from each other. And I think that's why people find it so difficult to find the right shoe for them because there's so much choice. It's like, where do I even start and where do I even begin? Um, so before maybe like just come on to the technology, one point I want to make with, with that then with the cushioning is what, what you'll find with running shoes now, so many that when you put them on is, is there's a degree of comfort. Um, and that, you know, you'll hear a lot of information about uh, picking a shoe based on comfort. Now, comfort's really important when it's used in context. So if you stand in a running shoe and you walk around a bit in it and it fits your foot quite well, then it might be really comfortable. But what happens when you've been running in it for a while? Um, and that's... But again, this is, this, that's totally ridiculous to do that and assume that right? Because if you go back to what you said at the start, walking and running are two very different mechanisms. Running is a series yeah. of... Whereas walking is a series of lose your balance a little bit and then heel strike more. Well, you basically heel strike first when you walk, whereas you're mainly, or you should be, mid foot ish. I think it's the same. Uh, yeah. Running. So nobody walks about, you know, striking mid foot when they walk. So why would you walk around, oh. you know, and go, oh, this shoe feels great? Well, it might feel great for walking around the shops or doing your shopping, but the minute you change your body shape and the kinematics and all that kick in, from that point of view, it's a totally different ballgame. Absolutely. And and really, 
that's one of the biggest evolutions in, in running shoes is then taking that on is but how much a running shoe can now help somebody. So the, the, the interesting thing with running is people look at a 20 minute run and they don't think of it as much. And, and people look at cushioning in terms of distance, but cushioning should be relative again to you and what the purpose is. So as an example, um, it's, it's, it's all about what your body's trained to do. So this morning I did a two hour run where I was just, I was running 4.45 minute per K pace. So I ran just under 26 K in two hours. And without being too like sort of frank and blase, that, that is very little for me. That's just a standard two hour, actually very easy run. Somebody that goes out for a 20 minute run might go through considerably more stress than what I went through in that two hour running. Because if you think about running, you're taking 160 to 180 steps a minute. Every time you're doing that, you're doing a single leg balance with, with knee rotation. So if you think times that by 20, how much, you, how many single leg hops you're doing, it's a lot of hopping. So what, one of the biggest things that's really stayed and going to stay in running shoes is more cushioning and um, a rocker like midsole. So going back to this hawker, if we look at the sole of this, can see how the sole of the shoe has got, yeah, it's got this curve. So how Hawker started was their ambition was to help, they're from Annecy in France, and their ambition was to help people run uh, faster downhill and run longer in more comfort. Two very simple goals. And the structure purpose of that heel curve was when you land, it would help transition the foot forward and make that action easier. And Hawker for a long time, people thought it was a fad and thought that it maybe wouldn't be here to stay. And there was quite a lot of uncertainty about where the brand would go. But the brand was built on very sound principles in terms of this is our objective. We're trying to help people run further for longer. And they were huge in ultra running at the start because what this rocker and stack height does is it stops your knee joint from flexing as much. And the cushioning is unbelievably light. So you actually don't, I always say to people, you, you want to feel like you've not got shoes on. When you've got the right shoe, you won't feel like you're wearing something, even if you've got lots of cushioning. So this, this um, people were running in flat shoes, which causing lots of stress and actually just making them pain, causing them pain. And at the same time, they were running in shoes, which were just too supportive, restricting their movement too much. So the biggest advancements in shoes is making shoes like this, which are ultra cushioned, but ultra lightweight and feel really natural on the foot. One thing that people find really difficult to do is actually do that, is to just move their foot forward. They have tight calves, they might have stiff toe joints, and a lot of people land with the feet turned out like that. And that's why they, they roll in is because we're actually not used to moving in a forward line. If you think about it, we're always turning, we're always changing direction. And what these shoes do is this rocker action helps people move with more comfort so that is something why you're seeing that in a lot of running shoes shoes with a curve it curve to the sole is we just know that it makes it easier to run um, and that's for slow pace and even for a uh, fast pace so so i was going to ask that question so if i was if i came to you 10 years ago and said i'm a cyclist or i've taken up triathlon and i've not done much running what kind of shoe would you recommend? I'm guessing you're going to say a hawker or something with that. Well, which kind of well comes... back, back then it wasn't available. I know that, but if we look at it from so, the now... Yeah. So if I... <laughs> absolutely. So if I was fitting you now, I'd be looking at finding a shoe which really complemented your foot shape and taking into the consideration that actually restricting that movement too much would cause you a problem. And something, because, you know, I think you said in the past, you get quite tight calf muscles. Yeah. So this is where sometimes people feet pronate and roll in because they find it difficult to flex through that movement and, and utilize and roll through the calf. So people think adding more extra stability in there will solve the problem. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Because if you think of the kind of my ankle when I ride my bike, I've got lots of flexion that way. But yeah. that way, that makes sense. Yeah the muscles on the front of my shins are really tight. So they're not yeah. a foot to do that because they are yeah. that. And because of the yeah. motion, 
you kind of trying to drop my heel and all that sort of stuff and be nice and smooth, it's a totally different mechanical movement to running, which it is. Totally. It, but from a, a range of movement and a kinematic point of view, again, it, it's very, very different, isn't it? It's just, these are the things you don't think about. You know, yeah. at, when you're actually looking at buying a shoe, you just, a lot of people, honestly, we look at the price and we go, bloody hell, they're 300 quid. And then it's going to last you like, 100k or sometimes less but it's the same in my sport you'll buy i, I remember buying tires which they were like a hundred quid a tire back in the day and that was a lot of money like you know 10 15 years ago and they only lasted 60k you know like a, it was like a really it was a dugas t- tubular tire it was almost like a a really thin almost like a condom kind of feel to yeah. it really really soft and again it's just translating your kind of your, your point of view from from my point of view from running to from from cycling to running and now when, I, when i've actually had this conversation with you i'm like yeah maybe i should buy myself a pair of hookers <laughs> <laughs> well the, the and so yeah no i mean the the, the rockers uh one one of the yeah one of one of the biggest things that hoka are a, a a brand that's growing very rapidly in the running market because they really do help take the load off running and they genuinely make it easier for people. And I, you know, I run in a lot of different brands um, and run in a lot of different shoes. But one thing I'll pay a testament to, you know, was, was last year in, in Ironman Barcelona on the run was the, the first time ever um, in the last 10K of a marathon in an Ironman where my legs, yes, my legs were screaming at me, but I didn't have the typical, stereotypical um, sort of, you know, real tightness in my calves and real sort of cramping sensation. And it was because I was running in a shoe with a carbon plate and a rocker. Yeah. And one thing that doesn't get talked to too much about in running is, is uh, oscillation. So vi- vibration is, accounts for probably about 25% of the fatigue that we go through. Wow. So as you run and you fatigue and get tired over the end of the run, it's because the muscles constantly just basically moving these little tiny oscillations. And that's how compression works. Compression stops muscles oscillating. Yeah. So compression is amazing for, for reducing uh, fatigue. But running brands are now designing midsoles which reduce oscillation. And for the first time ever, we're actually really able to see, say with running shoes, that they will actually significantly reduce the load on your muscles. And that's where, you know, there was a lot of um, hype. You mentioned Kipchoge there. There was a lot of hype made uh, last year when uh, Kipchoge ran under two hours. And people talked a lot about the shoe that he was wearing and it was an unfair advantage and it was doing too much. It wasn't. This, some people again will still argue, this is just good technology and it's actually pretty simple. It's just a piece of foam with some carbon plates. And... I think the, the best analogy of that for me is when Greg LeMond used aero bars in the 89 tour. And he was like, what the hell are they? Well, they're not very good. And he wins the tour by eight seconds. This is, yeah. the, this is the running equivalent of that change. And yeah. there's going to be several of these changes, but it's always going to, elite sport is always going to be an arms race. And that's just... Absolutely. Everyone is looking for that little half a percent here, half a percent there. And like you say, they were just literally ahead of the curve. Everything that they did on that day, with the pacers and the formation in which they ran and the, the road they did it on, it was just sheer science. And I think a perfect experiment to show what human beings can actually do when we look at data and we think about all of the environmental things like surface, gradient, um, wind resistance, all these things now, which are very, very commonplace in cycle sport, but now transitioning across to um, to running. I mean, I think the first people who wore Lycra when it came to running and tight fitting clothes were 100 meters runners. Even yeah. like 100 runner, maybe 400 runner would never wear like Lycra, but now everyone's on it, you know, and, and it's, it's graduating all the way through, obviously a little bit less to, to marathon, etc. But it, it's not going to be long before you're going to see adapting similar technologies to what you get on running uh, cycling skin suits and, and all this different kind of fabrics. But again, it sounds like Nike, unsurprisingly, were just ahead of the game. And I think that technology is only going to, A, help human performance, but it's also going to help people probably get more enjoyment out of running. Yeah. I think, yeah, because... 
I, I, I've actually thought it was, you know, it was really interesting reading people's comments about it. It's like they're, they're, they're trying, Nike have tried to solve a problem. They're trying to make something better. And they've, they've worked with an incredible amount caliber of, of athletes to, to come to that conclusion. And again, that's where the athlete and the brand relationship is so important and that they, they both respect each other. Because I remember like Jan Fredino in triathlon is, is ultimately hailed as the god, the god of the sport. He's Olympic champion. He's multiple Kona champion. And the guy just looks really good. He's, he's ripped. Um, but in... Um, in 2008, I heard, yes, he won the Olympic Games, but there was a huge concept where he, was, he wanted his shoes to be as light as they possibly could be. And he took a shoe called the Asics Piranha, which is one of their light, unbelievably lightweight racing flat, and he wanted it lighter again because he was so worried about getting a blister. He wanted everything stripped out the shoe. And it worked for him. He won, he won it. But if you look at what he was running in then compared to what people could be running in now, that would just it would actually call it, it would be a massive disadvantage and why nike are further ahead than other brands and why they've launched stuff is they've been working on these shoes since like 2014 they're they're just ahead of the curve and they they identified a problem which is people are breaking down in running and one of the number one things that causes people problems is either injury or fatigue so or overuse. There's, you know, Kipchoge after he ran that sub two hour marathon, the next day he went out and did a 40 minute run. And he's, and he said his legs were fine. Absolutely fine. Well, there you go. And he had way more in the tank when he did that sub two hour run. And that is because the shoe basically allowed him to get more out of himself. He, he wasn't fatiguing as much. The shoe wasn't making him faster. Basically these carbon fiber plates, they give you more energy return and they reduce muscle flexion. So again, one of the huge evolutions in running shoes is, as I was talking about at the, the start, one of the best ways to think about your shoes is if you're running slow, you want a softer shoe in theory because it, it will reduce your leg flexion, make it easier. If you're running faster, you want a more responsive shoe. What shoes are now doing with the foams that Nike and Hoka and now Saucony and Brooks are, and Asics are all bringing out in their own time, combining a carbon plate with that, you get an incredible amount of energy return, but you don't get the impact and muscle damage from running in a hard shoe. So you get all the benefits of a cushion shoe, but all the benefits then of a firm responsive racing shoe. And that's why the latest Alpha Fly from Nike costs 269 pounds, uh, almost 300 pounds, is because it is built on an unbelievable piece of um, technology and research and, and feedback. Um, and like Nike's, Nike's research facility is only the second biggest to U.S. military, so you know it's pretty special what goes into it. I think also that one of the things you have to remember there is that um, ultimately what it's doing is making Kipchoge just even more efficient. If you could, yeah. if it's impossible because the guy is just ridiculously efficient and he looks so graceful. It's it's outrageous. Yeah. It's just that arms race and something new comes in and it's, it's it's all hyped up and everyone kind of wants to jump on it and ban it and stop it and no, we can't do that. But sport needs to evolve, you know, and if, if we want to keep the sport being that spectacle and keep it, you know, as close as we can to being clean, obviously there's always going to be people trying to... It's going to have to be the technology that we're going to have to start looking at, you know, literally, or the changing of events and, and the way in which they run, whether it from... Uh, epic endurance point of view or a terrain point of view whatever but it's going to have to evolve at some point because now it's like the four minute mile isn't it now the two the two hour um marathon is done it's like who's next and that's going to just become the standard but just it's just wrong yeah. i think everyone will remember where they were when kipchoge did that and it was it was it was incredible to see the the actually the i can't remember the name of the documentary but it was, was it sub two or something the documentary was yeah yeah. Uh, and the amount of technology they went into from you know everything from the board and everything like that it wasn't just the shoe let's be honest it wasn't just the shoe people are just looking at the shoe and going oh it's that but it's yeah. not the shoe and let's just be honest about that it's never just that one thing but to basically bring this all back as we always do at the end of the spin things to think about are obviously jump in here if i'm missing stuff different kinds of shoes for different kinds of runs. 
absolutely. Three things, three different kinds of runs potentially. They've also got off road running as well, which yeah, obviously another whole different kind of shoe from the from a grip point of view and, and the sole point of view. Um, actually, get your shoes fitted properly. Yeah. Don't buy what looks nice and what's cheap. Spend a little bit of money on yeah. something. And if I was a person looking watching this right now, the first thing I would be thinking about would be buying a pair of hawkers. Oh, yeah. Because it makes sense because it's the right kind of shoe where you've got the right amount of cushioning and the right amount of support and it kind of does everything for you, doesn't it? It would be a nice, it would be a shame to go back to a pair of like Converse All Stars after wearing them because that would just be totally detrimental. But is there anything else that I've kind of missed in that? No, I think that that's the sort of, yeah, that's really key points to think about with shoes and just really try and avoid um, being caught up in the hype of what, like marketing is very powerful. And if you really know what you're looking at and you know a lot about footwear, then you can read the tech details on shoes and make a pretty informed decision on what's right for you. But if you don't, then you really do need to try the different things and see what's right for you. But really recognize with footwear as well, it's a two-way process as well. When you're deciding on something's right, if somebody is analyzing you for shoes, don't put all the onus on them because they can't tell you how your shoe feels on your feet. You need, you need to give that feedback. So this is where comfort, get provided with the information is, is really important. Um, pay attention to things like how, how many miles you're running in your shoes. Running shoes are starting to long, last longer and longer. I've actually run as a bit of an experiment up over a thousand miles in my current running shoes and they're still working, which is very, very impressive. And if you actually divide the miles by the cost, pretty good pence per mile. Um, so, you know, you can, running shoes are lasting longer because foams are evolving, shoes are getting better, but pay attention to your miles because the first thing is if your knee's getting a bit sore, you're feeling your hip, or you're feeling your uh, your your ankle, then that might just be because the cushioning's um, cushioning's gone. The the neck, the really the, one of the most important things is don't be afraid to ask questions and challenge things. You know, I'm here and we're here telling you know giving you this information, but go and do your research. But do informed research. You know, people can write anything they want on the internet and. I've seen so many people who have caused themselves problems or caused their own injuries because they've read some, a piece of information from somebody that isn't in a position to give that advice. And there's a lot of bloggers out there. There's a lot of influencers and footwear brands are throwing money at people who have a big following. And it's a very dangerous game because I quite a common comment I get from people I put shoes for is they'll come in and they say, oh, I bought this brand, I paid 130 pounds for it, and it caused me nothing but problems. So I'm never going to try a pair of those shoes again. And that might just be that there might be another shoe from that brand that works really well for them, but they've just gotten, they have gotten lucky with what they've bought and it's caused them a lot of problems. And that's something that brands need to think about as well with who they're giving product to and how they're selling their shoes. Yeah. Um, but take, take your time, try different things and l look at it for what it is. And running can be really, really easy and really enjoyable and really comfortable when you're in the right footwear. But again, there's no best thing. It's, it's what's right in the situation and what's right for the person. Cool. And obviously if, if anyone, there's a lot of information in this last yeah. so minutes, if anyone has got any further questions, because we've only got so much time to kind of maintain an audience, feel free to reach out to us. You can email me, jimmy at whatsyourmeta.com, or you can get Finn. Email address, Finn? Finlay at whatsyourmeta.com as well. It's Finlay, L-A-Y, L-E-Y. F-I-N-L-A-Y, yeah. <laughs> no, mate, that, that's been great. I mean, I, I've learned a lot of things there, and a lot of things that you've said totally resonate with my running experience. And I think there'll be quite a few people who are watching who will also kind of go, ah, oh, right, maybe I should look at different shoes and yeah. throw, throw the old shoes, shoes out and try something new because it might just be exactly what you need to rejuvenate your running. But I think yeah. that's pretty much all we can really talk about in this kind of... Yeah. I know you could just be talking about this for hours and that's yeah. it. 
feel free to reach out to us um, and get in touch with us via website as well, watchyourmeta.com. But do feel free if you I would like to, maybe we click and we subscribe will always help us. It's always nice and all that YouTuber stuff that people ask you to do. But no, thank you once again for joining us on another episode of The Knowledge and thank you for being a part of this meta community. Finley, have a great weekend, buddy. I will see you again next week and we wish a great weekend to everyone out there. Take care. Nice guys.